So now I'm excited to introduce Dr. Annie Frank and Kristen Neisler. Dr. Annie Frank is an associate professor of kinesiology in the Department of Teacher Education at DePaul University. Dr. Frank earned a BS in physical education from DePaul, an MS in human performance from the Western Illinois University, and an ED in instructional leadership from National, Unit, National Lewis University. She is currently the program director for the BS in physical education program, BS in exercise science program, and for an online MS in sport, fitness, and rec recreational leadership program. Her book, Sport and Education, discusses the challenges that surface when sports programs are embedded into an educational system. She also has publications in the Chronicle of Kinesiology, Physical Education, Higher Education, Teaching and Teacher Education, Journal of Computing and Teacher Education, and numerous presentations on diversity issues in physical education. Kristen Neisler began as a part-time adjunct professor in the College of Education in 2000 and as a full-time visiting professor in 2005. She accepted a full position as a clinical assistant faculty for the Physical Education Exercise Science slash pre-PT and MSFRL programs. Kristen also practices as a licensed physical therapist and as an athletic trainer. So I'm so excited to have these two very qualified uh, faculty members here with us today. And without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Hello all. Um, so we we're gonna start, but I know you guys are all muted. Um, so if you guys wouldn't mind just putting in the chat, we are just gonna kind of get a feel for the room. We can't see any of you. So just um, if you can put in the chat, if you have available to the chat, um, a scale of one to 10, how, knowledgeable are you on fitness and like health prevention and also from one to ten what's your kind of running comfortability are you a competent runner running a lot just starting out so from one to ten for each of those just so we can kind of get an idea of the room and, and who we're speaking to all right good twos, threes, sevens, fours. Okay, so a little bit of everybody. Great, wonderful. All right, as Kristen keeps looking at that, I'm gonna uh, can start. Um, we have an hour and both of us have um, some slide decks we wanna get through and we wanna provide you with all of the um, content that you're here to receive. Um, as Emily had mentioned, um, we have at DePaul, um, undergraduate degrees in physical education, exercise science, exercise science, pre-PT, and a master's, a fully online master's degree program. So as alumni, um, we would really um, appreciate it if you can um, share that with, with your friends and families and anybody who's thinking about coming to DePaul. Um, our um, programs are marketed, but certainly alumni and um, are the best way to, I think to share our programs with people. So um, don't hesitate or send people our way. So I just want to start with um, explaining or reviewing for you, you know, the really importance of just being fit and addressing the health, your holistic health. Um, the Centers for Disease Control is a great website to look for any resources that you need. These are all 2021 um, statements that regular exercise is one of the most important things you can do for your health. So, you know, I um, commend, commend you for participating in the fun run. I think one of the things that we're gonna talk about today is that everybody can experience the health benefits of physical activity, no matter what your age, your ability, your ethnicity, your shape, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody really should be um, taking care of themselves and becoming an exerciser or a mover or whatever is something that we should all be engaging in, talking to other people about. You, know, you can read the benefits of improving your health, your brain health, your weight. Oh my goodness, I thought I turned this off. Sorry. Um, reducing diseases, strengthening your bones and muscles, improving your ability to do everyday activities. You know, there's specific, um, more content on the CDC website. And I, and I think that's a very reputable one to use. If you have not been physically active in a while, you may be wondering how to do it, how to get started again. There's tips there, uh, how to get started. And then also about using physical activity to maintain a healthy weight. 
uh, learn more about what works and how physical activity can improve your health. Again, it's a wealth of information there um, and on the internet, and I'm sure that you routinely do that. Um, okay. Um, down here, all right. First concept I really wanna go over is a concept of wellness. Uh, you probably heard the term, but just a little bit to explain what it is. It's a very multifaceted concept and that being totally well is a combination of many different things. And if you can see there's intellectual health, emotional health, social health, environmental health, physical health, spiritual health. So to be totally well, we want to approach this as holistically as we can. And I'm going to talk about a little bit, some of the specifics a little bit later, but today's presentation will primarily be about physical health. But if we look at this, it is a continuum. And certainly you could be at one end of the continuum in one aspect, and then uh, at another end of the continuum in another aspect. But the objective is to constantly be thinking about how can I move myself along the continuum in the right direction. And they do feed upon themselves. Physical activity helps with a lot of different um, aspects of your life. Obviously, um, you know, weight control and emotional control. And um, so the concept of wellness is a really important one to consider all the time. So what is fitness? Fitness is the uh, adequate amount of strength and endurance to meet the needs of everyday life. Um, and I think that everyday life is somewhat um, contextual. Um, you know, if everyday life is going to work in your car, sitting at your office, coming home, and then sitting in front of the television, obviously you can do that. But I think we're talking about being physically active, walking, doing some physical things, physical things, and being able to do certain things. I know when I go to the um, doctor for a physical every year, the doctor will ask me, can I do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And it's all about physical um, activities that should be, I should be able to accomplish at my age. And I think that um, something that we should be conscious of. When we talk about fitness, there are several different components. Okay, th let's say three major categories. One is called health-related fitness. And these are necessary or relate to the prevention and the remediation of diseases. They're actually looking at the effects of exercise on cancer cells and cancer uh, tumors. Um, so this is a very broad area, but this is the area that we all should be mostly concerned about. There is another area of fitness called motor performance fitness. And those aspects of fitness are really essential to performing well in sports. And if it is, if that's your objective, then that's, those are some areas that I'll um, mention that you can continue to work on, but they're really not necessary if you're just focusing on how can I be physically healthy. We don't wanna underestimate the uh, importance of cosmetic health, you know, looking in a mirror, feeling good about yourself and how that supports your emotional and mental health. But obviously, it should not be confused with physical health, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Healthy um, health related components of fitness are the prevention of hypokinetic diseases. And these are diseases that really are caused by insufficient movement. Sad, but true. You know, the components are body composition, what percentage of your body weight is fat, and what is essential tissue and muscle, cardiovascular endurance, the ability to of the body to move, prolonged large muscle dynamic exercise at a vigorous or moderate intensity. Muscular endurance, the ability of a muscle group to perform work for an extended period of time. Muscle strength is the amount of force a muscle can produce with a single maximum effort. Flexibility, extremely important. The ability to move a joint through its full range of motion, very neglected, even in our young students, our young athletes. So these are the areas that we really should be focusing on if our, if our intention is to prevent and to address um, hypokinetic diseases. Um, 
health related fitness, when we talk about exercises, obviously we're talking about aerobic exercise versus anaerobic exercise. Um, and that's something that we can talk about in a little while. The, those components of skill related fitness are um, agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed. Those, if you think about them, are all related to being like a good athlete, being able to play basketball or volleyball or, you know, and I did highlight balance here because balance is certainly something that we should all be concerned about later in life. It's something that um, older individuals are um, training in as well. Um, in fact, there is a discussion about whether balance should be added to the health related components of fitness because certainly that they are preventing falls and um, the ability to continue to exercise. But these are the ones that we really pay less attention to these motor skill related fitness unless you have an objective to become a better athlete in a certain area, okay? So how much exercise should you need? Well, it's, we call it dose related fitness and there is a debate, it's very dynamic and um, how we address this, but um, we have, you know, it's, it's nice to kind of use these visuals and there is a pyramid for this dose related uh, or prescription of how much exercise you need. The bottom of the pyramid is just move, be a mover. And I'm gonna talk about that later, but you know, walk every day, walk your dog, be a mover, move. Um, you know, a lot of people are um, buying some type of device that will help them and remind them to get up and move. After 30 minutes of sitting without any movement, which we're all gonna do during this hour, basic physiological changes start to happen. Triglycerides start to elevate and other things like that. So we do wanna move and constantly get up and think about those lengths of inactivity that we are engaging in. Then as we move up, we wanna add some exercises where we're really focusing on the cardiovascular system, strengthening our bones um, and muscles and you know, enjoyment of recreation activities, okay? Um, three to four times a week. So every day be a mover, three to four times a week, engage in some focused form of exercise at least. And then strength activity should be the focus two days a week, flexibility, you know, at least two days a week, but really every day you should be thinking about fit, uh, flexibility. And then up at the top here are things that we should cut down and that's sitting, sitting in front of a computer, sitting in front of a TV. Um, this term progressive overload is on the slide and it means is that in order to improve, you do need to push it a little bit. You need to do a little bit more. You need to make it a little bit harder and overload the system to in fact engage in improvement of that system. When we prescribe exercises, we do address the FIT principle, which is how frequency we should, how frequently we should do this exercise, how intensely, and that could be in terms of heart rate or perceived exertion, and then how long should each session be. And that really is specific to the current exercise that you're doing. And then there is uh, cardiovascular versus strength training is very different in the types of prescription that we do. Um, social gradient, just to bring everybody's attention to this, and it might be uh, a challenge that you're facing, but the socioeconomic impact of health and fitness is as one moves down the socio social class, structure of developed nations, risk factors, and health problems increase. Okay, that means there's an increase in mortality and morbidity. Okay. Um, a lot of times we talk about, you know, is this a concern? Well, it should be a concern for everybody. It is an individual responsibility to be fit, take care of yourself, but it also is a social responsibility because um, everybody should have the ability, should um, have the least amount of roadblocks to becoming fit. And we know that um, the socioeconomic gradient is true and is um, obvious for many. A sociological view of this recognizes that the social context within people live do affect their house, their housing, their education, their health, okay, their access to nutritious foods, their access to a physical activity infrastructure, and also access to health care. 
Fitness programming is very different for each population. So if we talk about children and youth, it's different from adolescents than young adults. Um, you know, these are all different physiological um, animals, if you will, and they all take on different um, focuses and abilities. And so just because your children or your um, parent is doing one thing, it doesn't mean, you know, this isn't one size fit all. It's very specific to different populations. A little bit about life expectancy. Uh, we all know that females do have a longer life expectancy than males. I think this is probably pretty current. Um, our health costs of our aging population is extraordinary and it is totally unsustainable. That's why it is a social responsibility that we all do become healthier or as healthy as we can. And we allow everyone access so that um, our, we can begin to kind of um, get control over our health costs. As we know, it's an important aspect of every institution. DePaul is an institution and, and specifically individuals. The current generation of young people may be the first in American history to have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. The reason for that is the occupations that people are in are more sedentary, obviously the introduction of more technology, uh, television, um, not safe to go outside, um, things like that. Um, but the requirements of daily health in most urban societies are insignificant, insufficient to develop and maintain a healthy life. So this addition of exercise is important. So it isn't just being active throughout the day, the bottom of the pyramid, be a mover, but we do need to, because of our um, current state, um, of our environment and our society, we do need to add extra exercise to our lives. And so congratulations for being a runner. Um, healthy food is inexpensive, fast food, uh, healthy food is expensive. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Fast food consumption is dramatically on the increase and there we're having our rise in obesity rates across every population, most significantly in adolescents and children. Um, but then again, a significant amount of our adult population is obese. Why are we at this point? Well, cost, convenience of healthy food consumption, uh, the built environment, it really doesn't allow for a lot of walking, uh, bicycling, you know, we're getting better at all this, too much technology, um, you know, too much um, lack of transportation, lack of opportunity, expense, lack of time and safety. So I'll say safety. Um, I guess on this list, I just want to challenge you and say, you know, lack of time should not be a issue. Certainly, if you have to work two or three jobs, um, if you're always, or you're, if you're position your responsibilities require you to put in a 10, 12 hour day, well, then maybe you need to rethink that and say, how can I better my um, situation so that I will have time for leisure? Because during that leisure time, I do need to exercise. I need to engage in type, type additional physical activity. You know, Figure out why you keep saying, I don't have the time to exercise. Self-efficacy is an important concept in being a regular exerciser. You know, 90% of Americans do believe that regular exercise is important to health, but that belief certainly does not equate to behavior. You know, um, your perception of your ability to, to exercise, to perform physically at whatever you're considering, and your ability to actually be consistent at that is very much dedicated or dependent on your confidence in accomplishing it. So don't let your you know, negative thoughts or, oh, I can't do that, or um, I missed a day. Um, no, get back on it and um, know that you can accomplish anything that you do set yourself, your mind to do so. I did want to revisit this um, just a little bit physical. I'm going to talk more specifically about a little bit more of these components, intellectual, emotional, social, physical, spiritual. Um, so where do you fall on this? Think a little bit about, you know, what right now are you challenged by? 
what do you need to spend a little bit more time on, energy on, or find more information on? So what are your individual needs, in other words, in terms of obtaining a healthy weight? Um, what about the quality of food that you're eating? What about your level of exercise? You know, I want to say just become a mover. What about your social situation? Do you have friends? Who do you talk to? Sleep, how much you're getting? And then for your emotional and mental health, you need to be positive. So let me talk quickly, unless we have any questions in the chat about anything. I'm gonna quickly go over those and then uh, I am probably gonna move on to Kristen unless there's other specific questions about it. So maintaining a healthy weight, um, really important. Do you know what your body composition is? Um, the Raymeyer Recreation um, Facility on campus can measure that. If you are a member of a gym, it can be measured. You might've had it done in high school. It probably was inaccurate at that point in time. Try and find somebody who is an expert at it and get it done. Um, if you go to the doctor's office, the doctor is gonna to talk to you about your um, BMI or body mass index. That is really not a very valid measurement of your body composition. So try to get that done um, by someone who actually really does know. Again, get it done by skin fold and not by biological impedance. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you want. Have you ever tracked your calories that you're taking in? I think tracking your calories is an excellent way to maintain, obtain and then maintain a healthy weight because there is some level of um, accountability for the things that you're putting in your mouth. You know, um, Are you a grazer and you just kind of eat little Bits. Or when you sit down and you eat a meal, how much of the meal do you eat? You know, do you have any idea about the amount of calories in a certain meal? So tracking your calories is probably a good idea if you've never done it. You know, have you ever thought about the wasted calories that you um, do eat? You know, beverages that have sugar in them, even sport drinks. Um, you know pretty much wasted calories. Sport drinks aren't needed unless you're really expending a lot of calories going on long runs. You know, the basic principle of calories in should equal calories out is probably the most important principle that you should keep thinking about. And then we do need to think about muscle mass. If you are an athlete, you've got a lot more muscle mass and that is heavy weight or heavy or weight in response in uh, comparison to fat weight. The quality of the food that you're choosing, um, what, do you, what is your sodium intake, saturated fat, your sugar, your starches, as opposed to your fruits and vegetables? Are you getting some protein? Are you getting too much protein? Cholesterol is something that you should consider um, or at least know what your serum cholesterol level is so that you can make a educated decision about how much cholesterol you should eat. Okay. So these are areas that you want to be concerned with. You know, you know, if we were um, really engaging, I would ask you, what is the best exercise? And then take a 15 seconds to think, you know, what is the best exercise? What have you been told? Well, the answer to that question is, the best exercise is whatever you're willing to do and ever you enjoy, and therefore you will continue to do it. So figure out what exercise you enjoy. It might be going to group exercise classes. It might be taking a brisk walk. It might be playing racquetball, whatever it is, that's the best exercise for you because you're going to enjoy it and you're going to continue to do it. You know, realize there's a difference between running and jogging and walking, and where do you fit in there? You know, you don't have to run. Jog is efficient. You know, brisk walking is efficient. So, what's your objective, and then what will you choose in terms of the intensity of the exercise? Flexibility, extremely, extremely important. Um, if you're having, and if Kristen's going to talk about injury and injury prevention, just a few minutes here, she's probably going to talk about flexibility and trying to maintain that mobility at every joint. Um, and flexibility probably can almost cure any of the uh, problems that you're having. Pay attention to strength and maintaining your strength as you age. And then choose and know why it's better to be 
engaging in aerobic exercise, which is prolonged exercise using the air that you're breathing in, as opposed to sprinting, you know, short bursts of quick exercise. And when we talk about, you know, exercise and moving, just become a mover, move as much as you can. Um, socialization, you know, people who have a strong social network have a better quality of life and they live longer. Um, who do you talk to? How many friends do you have? You know, those are important decisions and or things to consider. And then what decisions do you need to make related to that? Are you getting six to eight hours a night? You should, you know, just because you're older doesn't mean you should sleep less. Um, it really does have a profound effect on your health. Figure out what interferes with your quality of sleep and address it. And don't just write it off to, well, I don't sleep much. Mental health, I think every single person should think that you are on a mental health continuum. You know, everybody's a little strange. Okay, let's admit it. Where are you on that? Figure out where you're at and what you may be dealing with and then get help from somebody. Support each other. You know, if you need professional help, address anxiety, help address depression, address all the worrying that we do and um, support each other and be kind to each other. Okay. So I guess that's what I wanted to share with you from my perspective. And as I'm looking at my watch, it's about halfway through. So I'm gonna let Kristen take over and then we'll address your questions at the end. And um, there we go. Annie, do you wanna get the one question? There's one in there. Okay. Um, let me, why don't you pull up your screen as I'm reading it. Here's some sure. research metabolic, metabolic rates how someone can track how many calories they burn a day. If you have a, um, a calorie tracker, if you um, track your exercise, it will suggest a calorie, you know, there's suggestions to how many calories you burn if you go for the 30 minute walk or an hour walk, or, you know, I know I use, um, Noom, and if I put in that I um, swam for 50 minutes, it's going to suggest a certain calorie intake. So there are ca um, calorie burning trackers, exercise trackers that will suggest that. Yes, if you have a faster metabolism, it's definitely advantageous. And that when you're sitting, when you're you know on idle, you are burning more calories. And if you had a slow metabolism, exercise increases your basal metabolic rate, and eating. Um, periodically having muscle mass, they all increase your muscle mass and muscle mass will increase your basal metabolic rate. So incre incre increasing that is important, but it's still calories in, calories out. Okay. All right, great. Um, you can hear me, right, Annie? Mm -hmm. Lost yeah. my Okay. So I am Kristen Neisler, as previously mentioned, I'm a, I teach in the College of Education and I'm also a currently practicing physical therapist and athletic trainer. So I wanna talk a little bit about common running injuries and prevention. Uh, looked like all of you were somewhere not at the one range of running um, experience. So I'm guessing you've all had experience with running injuries then, since especially these, which are pretty common. Oh, I'm going through the same issue you had. Oh, here we go. So this is some of the common ones. We're not gonna talk about all of these, but we're gonna talk about most of these common running injuries. So uh, low back pain, we're gonna talk about more piriformis syndrome, which is like a glute discomfort, hamstring strains, iliotibial band syndrome, Achilles tendonitis, calf strains, patellofemoral pain syndrome, plantar fasciitis, and shin splints. So lots can go wrong with running. And then we're gonna talk about some prevention. So we're going to start at the hip and work our way down. Uh, iliotibial band friction syndrome. Um, this can present with pain in a couple of different areas. I actually, I'll show you in just a second. Um, it can start anywhere from the outside of the hip and course down the outside of your leg, but pain typically presents right on the outside of the knee. Um, and it hurts, like if you're running and then you, you stop to get a drink of water, 
that's when you go to start running again and all of a sudden you can't bend your knee you have severe pain on the outside of your knee um you get running you get jogging a little bit faster and it, it'll go away or if you've been sitting for a long time after a workout you get up to stand and you get that sharp pain on the outside of your knee um just gonna i pulled up some pictures of the hips and stuff so the it band is this long coursing thing on the outside of your hip whoops wrong way so this is what it looks like it's right here and usually one of the biggest issues with it band syndrome is that this muscle that attaches to it which is called the tfl is weak so a lot of the hip um lateral that hip abductors are the ones on the outside of your hip are weak we run and everything we do all day is typically in the sagittal plane so we're running straight forward so if you're not doing strength in that side to side plane you can typically get um it band syndrome so what can we do to prevent it um really strengthening, especially the outside of the hip and the hip rotators. Um, some postural imbalance can cause it as well. So if you're somebody, if the knees kind of fall in, that can cause, um, so if you have flat feet, that's gonna cause your lower leg to rotate in, your knees to come in a little bit. So you have a little bit of that valgus looking, um, I forget what the layman's term, but your knees kind of come in more than your feet. And that typically will also cause tightness in the IT band. So foam rolling, um, any type of deep tissue massage that you can get to that IT band, ice at the insertion point. If you are having that knee pain, I actually recommend putting little Dixie cups in the freezer and then just with water in them and then ripping it down. You have a little bit of ice and just do an ice massage to that spot. For ice, you want to ice until it's numb. So when you can't feel it anymore, you're done icing. And then you don't want to ice again until your skin has gone back to room temperature. Some balance exercises, again, those are typically for strength of the outside of the hips, core strength, um, postural retraining, possible inserts, because again, this could be coming from the ground up. A lot of times it happens because of flat pronated feet. So even either inserts or getting a new pair of shoes can actually sometimes resolve this on its own. And I'll go over some of the different balance and strength exercises at the end of the presentation. Piriformis syndrome, the pain in the butt, literally. Um, hip weakness and core weakness um, causes an overuse of this muscle, which causes it to tighten and it causes muscle kind of deep, achy pain. And it typically increases the more you run, the more you get it, or if you're sitting, you get it. And this one, you can probably see why it is such a painful. Um, it's usually when your glutes are weak. So, you know, here's the big glute muscle that should be working, but a lot of times the glute is weak and here's the piriformis. So that one has to do a lot of the job of the glute, which it shouldn't have to do. So it can get really tight and just again, have a deep ache in your buttocks. Not only can you get a deep achy pain, it also could pinch the sciatic nerve. So you should, you could also get pain from your butt shooting down the back of your leg. So this one can cause a lot of different problems. And how are we going to treat this one? Um, stretching of that piriformis muscle. That's like that figure four position. I didn't include this in my stretching, but lying on your back, putting your an one ankle on the opposite knee and pulling your knee up to your chest, even sitting with your leg crossed and just bending forward can give it a good stretch. Um, deep tissue, tissue massage to the piriformis, hip and core strengthening, which we're going to talk about, and then some internal and external rotation strength and balance. So even just standing on your leg <clears throat> and just rotating your hips in and out to get that hip rotator strength. But glute strength, just doing squats even can help it just by getting the glute a little bit stronger. All right, moving down to the knee, we only have really one that we're covering at the knee, but again, the IT band can actually be a hip or a knee injury. This injury is probably the most common knee injury in runners. They actually call it runner's knee. Uh, this is the general diagnosis that almost everybody gets when they have knee pain. They just call it PFPS. It's patellofemoral pain syndrome. So this is really just an injury of uh, the, the patella um doesn't track correctly because of either strength deficits or flexibility um deficits so the kneecap here 
really it'll either track laterally that can happen actually because of it band syndrome so if the it band it kind of you can see how it attaches to it here um so if the patella tracks to the outside you can get some pain kind of on the outside of your knee um usually this muscle this part of the quads a little bit weaker than this aspect of the quad so it'll also cause it to shift um so you can it's just really this patella instead of sitting perfectly in the groove of the femur your thigh bone it shifts and it actually rubs up against the back of the femur and that's what causes that just chronically achy pain um so with this one the way it presents typically is just pain around the kneecap or you feel like it's underneath the kneecap pain typically with going downstairs more than going up prolonged sitting and running quad weakness is probably the number one reason that we get it, but it can also be hip weakness because I said the IT band tracks to the patella. So if the TFL and lateral hip is weak, it's going to cause the IT band to be tight and that's going to pull the patella laterally. Um, overuse and just endurance weakness again, so runner's knee. Um, treatment, if you notice a theme here, the treatment's almost the same for all of these injuries. Hip and core stabilization exercises, quad strengthening exercises, um, IT band and hamstring stretching, and possibly some inserts as well, because uh, patellofemoral pain sometimes also presents with that knee in um, posture, which causes the feet to collapse into pronation. So getting the feet to come up can actually help align the knees better and the patella. All right, we are moving on, just looking at time, we're good. The ankle. So we've got a cup, the ones I didn't talk about so far from the top half of the body, low back pain, um, usually that's caused because poor core strength. Um, we tend to run and if you run in this upright position, your pelvis is actually anterior a little bit. So, and if, cause your abs are weak and your abs are on a stretch and then your low back is really tight. And so you're running up and down. Every time you run, you put three times your body weight through your lower body. So every time, or every time you hit the ground. So the low back gets really tight. So low back pain, typically the best treatment for that is core strength. Um, hamstring strains, um, calf strains, we'll talk about that a little bit, but hamstring strains, those are hard ones. Any type of muscular strains, Unfortunately, especially because you keep running, they're hard to get rid of because they need rest. That's the number one thing they need. And you're not giving it to them usually because people want to just keep running or you're training for something. Um, but some, you know, stretching, but not to the point of pain, ice, and rest as much as possible for any uh, muscular issues. All right, moving on to the ankle. Plantar fasciitis, another real common one in runners. Typically you get pain, it's a very specific spot on the kind of inside of the bottom of your foot, right on your heel. So if this is my foot, it's right there in one spot. Sometimes you'll actually get it to stretch through the bottom of the foot. This one's usually extremely painful when you first get out of bed in the morning. When you sleep at night with the covers especially, or just because of the bed, you kind of sleep in a toe pointed position. And so that tightens up the Achilles and it tightens up the plantar fascia. And then you go to give that big stretch in the morning and your foot gets stretched out and then it just pulls on that bone. So it's really just a pulling on that bone. Um, same thing as uh, the IT band syndrome. Once you kind of get moving and, and running or just moving throughout your day, it typically feels better. Um, this one you can see, uh, let's see, showing a different one first, but we'll show this one. Okay, uh, I'm trying to rotate it. Okay, uh, this is, yep, right here. Oh, oh, I dissected it off a bit. Hold on, one more, right there, the big white tissue. So it's a thick aponeurosis, it's a thick tissue. And as you can see, if we're, especially if you're you've got flat feet, you're pronating all day long and it's just putting a big stretch on this. And then it attaches right to the bone and this is where it typically hurts. So um, weakness in the calf can cause it, weakness in the foot intrinsic. So all those little muscles, muscles in the feet that I had just, all of these, if those are weak, um, those can actually cause the uh, 
plantar fascia to hurt as well. And if you have pronated or supinated feet. Treatment, same as the other ones, anytime you have point tenderness at a bone, you wanna ice it, you can do a deep tissue massage or deep tissue ice to it with the ice cup. Um, rolling on a golf ball, rolling on a rolling pin to the bottom of your foot. I even have people um, put ice bottles, um, just plastic ice uh, drinking water in the freezer and then roll that. And then you're getting deep tissue massage and ice at the same time. You can use a tennis ball, racquetball. We use lacrosse balls a bunch. Um, it's, you know, again, the same thing as everything. It's really about postural alignment. So a lot of times the hips are weak causes the knees to come in, causes the feet to come in. So the pain, I talked about coming from the foot up, but it can also come from the hip down. You wanna do some foot and lower leg balance exercises, toe curls, so like picking up a towel with your foot or picking up a pencil. Um, calf stretches, I, actually, I tell people they need to stretch their calf for 15 minutes a day. Um, uh, so that can be, if you think about it, five times a day for three minutes, not that big of a deal. Um, so lots and lots and lots of calf stretching. If it's very severe, they may put you in a night splint, which is uncomfortable. Imagine like wearing boots to bed, but it's just a boot that puts your, or sometimes they keep it smaller and soft, but it keeps your ankle in a 90 degree angle so that you can't point your toe during the night, um, but they work. Uh, okay, so I think we got, one or two more Achilles tendonitis. So this would be pain in your calf. So it's kind of also can be like a calf strain and pain at the bottom of your heel too. But for plantar fasciitis, it's on the bottom of your foot. For Achilles, it's more in the back of your heel. So right where that tendon structure hits the heel. Why do we get this one? This is usually calf tightness. So again, I would probably use the same concept as plantar fasciitis, 15 minutes of stretching a day. Um, also for you toe runners, so you get it because you're up and you're con contracting that calf every time you run. So a lot of times that causes the um, Achilles to get sore. You can also have just weakness in your lower leg and foot, which is gonna cause the calf to overwork. Um, ice, calf stretching, as we said, here are, here are all these things again, hip and core stabilization exercises, lower leg balance exercises. Calf eccentrics are a huge one, which I'll show you in just a minute. Cross friction to the Achilles tendon. So it's like a deep tissue massage to that tendon, just like you would do to the IT band and to the calf. Um, inserts are probably a good idea for this one. I really like super feet. Um, you can get them at Dick's Sporting Good. You can get them at just any, you can get them online, get them at Amazon. Um, it's a pretty basic universal insert that you can get it put into your shoes. Um, but I also really recommend getting new shoes. And if you get new shoes, I recommend going to, um, I knew I was going to blank on this one. Um, running away was one of the stores. Um, ooh, the other one's on North, going to a, a shoe store, a running store. And they always say, when you go in there, don't, don't come in and say, I want to buy a you know pink or blue or green pair of shoes. You come in, they look at your foot and they say, here's the three shoes that you can pick from. And I'll tell you, when I started doing that, it made a world of difference in my running. I could not believe how much better I felt when I had shoes actually fitted to my foot. Well, designed for my foot, technically. Calf stretches. And sometimes they actually put you in a night splint with Achilles tendonitis. All right, last one, shin splints. So this is just pain in the front of your shin, up and down it. It's typically on the bone or right off of the bone in the front of your shin. Um, this one typically decreases, again, decreases as you continue running, but after you run, it can get really, really sore. Um, there's like a bunch of muscles in your foot and lower leg, and they, so for example, they just get imbalanced. So like this is the anterior tib. So oh, I dissected it again. Um, so this one actually pulls on the bone a lot. And then there's one deep back in here. It's over here. This is the posterior tib. So usually it's either anterior tibialis, tendonitis or, or muscular issues or posterior tibialis muscular issues. These two muscles work on 
pulling the foot up and the calf works on pulling the foot down. So, so pushing off, but you, so a lot of times we don't strengthen the pulling up of the muscle, especially if you're not used to running your body's not, you know, when you walk, you don't really have to pull your foot up that much. You just kind of swing your leg through, but with running, you have to pull your leg all the way through and your toes up. So pulling your toes up that numerous times, you can start to get this deep ache in the front of your shins. And that's typically because these muscles are just not used to that, that type of work. And calf tightness can cause it as well, because if your calves are tight, you can't come up all the way easily. Muscle imbalances between those muscles. So maybe the tibialis anterior is tighter or stronger than the posterior muscle. So that can cause it calf tightness, weakness, that sort of thing. Ice up and down that shin, wherever your pain is to the point of numbness, calf stretching hip core stabilization exercises, there it is again, um, and foot lower leg balance exercises, inserts deep tissue massage to the attachment of the tibia. So the muscle like right as it attaches to the bone. Okay, um, so talking about treatment, um, I don't, I wanna leave some time for questions. So I am, I had put a video in here and I can put the, uh, it's just a really good active warm up for runners. Um, after we're done, I can put the link in the chat or you guys also, um, I think have, will have access to these presentations. I can, or I can send them to you. So this one, um, I actually just found it on YouTube, but this is a Dr. Ryan DeBell and it just, it's, I think I put an active warm up for athletes or for runners, uh, five minute dynamic warm up for war getting ready for running. You should be going for about a five minute walk or a very light jog, then you should be doing active warm up. A lot of people just sit on the ground and stretch, just do long hold, sustained static stretching. You shouldn't be doing that before the run. You do that after the run. So before the run, it should be active warm up. So like cheerleader kicks where you're kicking your legs out in front of you, butt kicks where you're bringing your feet up behind you. Here he's doing like just kind of a runner's hop. Um, hip rotation exercises. So it should all be just kind of short, um, slow-ish movements um, that work up to being more fast and dynamic that, of the, how you're running. So you will do that after you do about five minutes of getting the blood pumping, then you go for your run. When you're done, that's when you can stretch out the muscles that have been contracting the entire time you've been running. So you can get on the floor, do your hamstring stretches, quad stretches, things like that. Strength exercises. So we talked about hip core stabilization, primarily hip outside of the hip. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they start running is they stop strengthening. So all they're doing is running and they think that that's enough to prevent injury. And you need to have strong muscles in order to have the endurance strength to perform running without pain. So these very easy ones, these don't, you don't have to be at a gym to do these. So just some lunges with these, you wanna make sure your knee lines directly up over your second and third toe and your knee should not go past your toe. I usually tell people as you step forward, drive your back knee down to the ground and that puts you in perfect position. For squats, to do these in a good position, same thing, you want your knee to be directly over your toe and you sit back, best way to do a perfect squat is to put a chair behind you and go down like you're gonna sit in it. And then I say, there's a tack on the chair. So touch the tack and come back up, but don't get the, let the tack sticky on the bottom. So it's just going back to sit in a chair instead of squatting forward with your knees forward. So chair sit backs can be another one that we call those squats. Those hip, hip exercises. Um, oh, I left one off of here. So um, hip sidestepping with a band is a really good one. If you can find them, I had a whole, I bought a whole package of these at, for Amazon really cheap, just these Therabands that go around your ankles. Um, you want to make it even harder, put run around, around your knees and your ankles, and you're just sidestepping. That's going to help strengthen the TFL, the lateral hips, so that it helps keep your hips level and not dropping every time you run. This one just shows some balance. We talked about balance, core exercises. This is for the hip too. I like to do these motions kind of short and fast. So you could do them slow to start. So you're standing on one leg and just swinging your leg front and back. And then you're going to work on doing it faster and faster and even getting the, the 
arms pumping. You'll feel it working the opposite hip, the one that you're standing on. Then the same thing, starting going slow in and out to the side and then short and fast. And then here's a hip rotating one that you can do as well. Um, to progress these, you can stand on an uneven surface, just put a couch cushion on the floor, or stand on a pillow. It's just gonna make it a lot harder. Close your eyes and try to do it. That's gonna make it a lot harder. Um, these are just really good for, for balance exercises for your hip and your core. When you do it, you want your hips to stay level and stay straight. So you don't want your hips to be moving up and down. So the leg that's standing on it, it should be completely level. The only thing that you should, that should be moving should be your opposite leg. Um, the one I didn't put on here that I meant to was just clamshells. I think you guys probably know that you're lying on your side, your knees are bent, your foot, hip, and shoulder should line up and the knee should be in front of it. And if you have these bands, you can put them around your knees. You're going to keep your hips forward and just rotate your hip up. Um, so that's the clamshell. Sorry, I had a picture. I just forgot to put it in here. Calf strength, if you get Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis, this bottom picture is eccentrics. So you're gonna go up. Usually I actually have people go up with two feet, transfer your weight to one foot while they're up on their toes and then slowly lower till you go down past the step. And you can do it with your leg straight, also with your leg bent, the one you're standing on. These are eccentrics. They, practice the lengthening effect of that calf. So this actually helps with Achilles tendonitis. Um, also just working on straight calf raises are important too. So overall prevention, as we mentioned, don't forget to continue to stretch and strengthen. Very important, even as you ramp up running, it's important to have at least two days of strengthening a week. Also consider varying your training. So um, not always going out for the same pace and the same distance, trying some short speed intervals. If you want to get faster, that's actually the best way to get faster too, is to do shorter runs and to do speed intervals. You don't even have to do it for a distance. You could say, I'm going to sprint as fast as I can for 30 seconds. Then I'm going to walk for two minutes. Then I'm going to sprint as fast as I can for 30 seconds, walk for two minutes um, and do that for 15 to 20 minutes. Usually speed workouts are shorter. So if there's a day that you don't have much time to run, you can do a speed workout and you'll get just as good of effect as doing a longer low endurance run. Intervals, so even just doing jogging and sprinting, jogging and sprinting, changing it up. Some long runs are important. And then it's always okay to cross train. You should cross train. So on a day where you're feeling tired or your knees or body's hurting, swimming, biking, rowing, elliptical. My best running shape I was ever in was when I was biking significantly because of that strength it gave me. Listen to your body. I always tell people when you exercise or go for a run, go run for five minutes. If you don't want to run, you're sitting at your desk, you're like, oh, I don't want to go for a run today. Or you're at home, you're on the couch, you don't want to go for a run. Go run for five minutes. If after five minutes, you still don't want to run, you're not feeling it, that's your body telling you don't want to. You all know when this happens, usually though, you get out there, you run for five minutes and you're like, oh, I feel good. I want to get it going. You got that blood pumping. If you're not feeling good after five minutes, stop. Make sure it's important for nutrition, hydration before, during, and after. You want to drink three cups of water for every one pound of weight loss. Rest days, very, very, very important. I would say one to two a week. Possibly new shoes, getting those fitted. And then even if you may need to, if you have pain, it's not going away, you may want to see a physical therapist. I work for Rush Physical Therapy, and we actually have two clinics on campus. And you can go into any one of those clinics or call and schedule a free injury screen. So they will look at any of your injuries that you have and kind of give you an idea of, oh, I think you need to see a doctor or no, just try a couple of these stretches or, you know, I think it would benefit you from coming into physical therapy. And I think that's it. Um, so thank you. And I will check to see, we've got questions. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. This was such an uh, informative presentation. So awesome. We do have a couple of questions. And of course, to anybody that is watching, feel free to submit those questions that you have as well in the Q&A. Um, and we will try and share as many of those as we can. Um, one question, you talked a little bit about going in and getting really fitted for sneakers. Is there any general tips that you could share about what to take into consideration when you're buying sneakers for running, walking, trying to increase your exercise? Um, or do you recommend really going in and, and talking to an expert? I 
really recommend going and talking to somebody. <clears throat> um, I just think that they, you know, you may say, oh, I've got high arches or flat feet, but to know which shoe supports that is really hard, even with me as a physical therapist. So um, I, you know, even if you don't buy them, at least go in and get, you know, let them know that, oh, okay, Brooks are really good for you. Or Asics are really good for you. Different shoes usually have different amounts of support. So I do really recommend that. Now, if you're not willing or not wanting to spend the money on new shoes, you could just start with getting like a super foot insert super feet um, and see if that works, see how it feels. And if that's enough, when you do those, you make sure you take out the insert that's in your foot, the one that or in your shoe, the one that comes with it, and then put the shoe, uh, insert in there. Also, if you're ever using inserts, you have to warm, uh, wear them in. So you actually only want to wear them for like an hour or two day one and only walking. Then you want to wear it for, um, you know, three hours, increase your time that you're wearing them. And so you want to walk in them for at least three to four days before you actually go for a run. So don't just put them in and go for a run. And make sure that when you get, you get sized, right. The number one problem is a lot of people, they don't wear, their shoes aren't big enough. They wear too small a size. And yeah, you usually around. size up almost an entire size. Yeah. So larger um, shoes. Okay. Good things to keep in mind for post-run recovery and our post-run nutrition. Good question. Um, beforehand, you want to be really thinking about water, hydration, and carbohydrates. You need to get some sugar into your body, not just sugar like a candy bar, but um, you know, oatmeal, yogurt, bagel, things like that. Um, so something to get in, I would say between 150 and 300 calories of carbohydrates. Um, and then afterwards you want to replenish water, carbs again, and protein. So just having some and protein shakes, you know, a lot of people ask about those. If you eat meat, typically you do not need a protein shake. Meat, typical meat eaters eat double the amount of protein that we need. So any excess protein that you're taking in ends up being turning into fat. Um, so I don't recommend those, um, but yeah. So carbs, protein, water after carbs, water before. Mm. Exercising in cold weather. Mm, that's a good one. Layer. Lots of layers. There's not one thing that you either need to keep on or take off. Um, a much longer warm up schedule. So I said five minutes. I would probably do a five minute walk, five minute light jog than a dynamic warm up. So you want to make sure that you're not just getting out there, run, which is hard. So you might want to even if you're at a gym or something, warm up inside and then slowly warm up outside. But just going outside, you want to start running because it's cold, but it's important to slowly warm up and not just start running in the cold because you're much more likely to pull a muscle. Mm -hmm. And maybe a runner gate, if it's a runner's gator, if it's really cold, to, you know, filter that air a little bit for your, and you know, and if it's too cold, don't run inside, you know, you really could be hurting your lungs. Do these injuries come from mostly running or can they occur? Yep. All of these can occur with walking. A lot of them can occur just with life. Uh, piriformis syndrome happens from sitting at a desk too long. Uh, low back pain, sitting at a desk too long. Uh, so yeah, they can happen with anything. Um, tips for good running or walking posture. Um, I would say the biggest thing that is just, I always tell people, think of a tight pair of pants. So pulling your belly button in towards your spine as if you're trying to put on a tight pair of pants. That just creates a good cylindrical um, muscular corset around your spine, which helps to protect your back. Um, so that's important. Arm swing, when you're using your arm swing, don't lift your shoulders up. So try and get your shoulders to relax. Breathing in, when you breathe, you want to think about breathing in through your upper back, so up into here, um, and expanding your rib cage. As we run and get tired, we tend to breathe with our upper trap, so we're like, and then we tend to get neck pain, upper trap pain, all of that. So relax shoulders, breathing in and out through your rib cage, belly button in towards your spine. Heel strike in the front. So, you know, sometimes heel strike to flat foot. Sometimes people don't like to fully heel strike. Um, so at least hitting flat foot, not just running on your toes. Mm, good arm swing. I think those are the big ones. Awesome. Well, I know we're a few minutes over at this point. So if we don't have any more questions, then I think we'll wrap up. Um, we'll also mention, of course, we have our all for DePaul virtual fun run, which is coming up um, October 10th through the 18th. If you haven't registered already, definitely check it out. 
Um, you can find more information on our website, alumni.tepal.edu. Um, registration for everyone but students is $25 and you get a really awesome long sleeve DePaul dry fit. Um, it's an awesome way to kind of motivate yourself to have something to train for and work towards and get out and enjoy this beautiful fall weather, hopefully wherever you are. So um, we'll include more information about that. Um, and um, Kristen will definitely include the video that you had mentioned as well in our post event email. But um, for now, thank you both so much for joining us today and sharing all these awesome tips and your expertise with our alumni. Um, of course, to everyone who joined us today, thank you for spending your lunch hour or adjacent to your lunch hour, depending where you're calling in from with us. And um, I hope we'll see you all soon. Thank you. It was our thank pleasure. You.